this is the first episode of, of, of I guess, fall, last episode of summer. And um, because we're pre-recording this, mm-hmm. we wanted to do something that was going to be fun, uh, festive, but also, you know, serious. And uh, I brought we brought in two people who have been on the show before, who we love deeply, who are super, super smart about things that are not related to the topic that we are going to talk about today, which is... <laughs> Reality TV. Uh, I'm going to bring in both members of our panel today. First, she's a theoretical astrophysicist and author of the book, The Disordered Cosmos, A Journey into Dark Matter, Space, Time, and Dreams Deferred. Did you know that she's also one of the universe's biggest fans of reality dating shows? (laughs) Dr. Chanda Prescott-Weinstein, welcome back to Hysteria. Thank you for having me in my totality. <laughs> <laughs> you contain multitudes. <laughs> my multitudes. Um, also, I want to make a let our listeners know that I recently just started watching 90 Day Fiance for the first time. So excited. And so excited. Alyssa and Chanda have been frequent text friends. I've been like, what is going on? And they're, I can sense the glee on the other end of the text exchange it's true. that I finally, <laughs> yes. finally succumbed. Uh, rounding out our panel today, our next guest is a writer, director, and author of Girls Can Kiss Now, Out Now. Her first short film and directorial debut, The Ladies, just premiered at Outfest this July. She's also a founding member of the Chessie fan club. Jill, <laughs> Gun- <laughs> Jill Gunwitz, welcome to Hysteria. Thank you. Thank you for having me back. Yeah, I guess I am a founding member. <laughs> <laughs> or I'm just keeping it going. <laughs> uh, I wonder what those meetings would be like. The ch- it would. What what would you picture? I think it's just like a bunch of women sitting around in like denim shirts, similar to a pumpkin spice latte meeting, actually, <laughs> <laughs> and just showing each other photos and being like, "Is this is this what I should wear?" And it's just more photos of denim shirts and. <laughs> things tied around your waist. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I feel like chessy chic could be a fashion moment like moving yeah. into fall. Like all it needs is a trend piece in EW or something like that that's like all the women are going crazy for chessy chic and and it would take off. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm super excited to have this group as I mentioned. I started watching 90 Day Fiance not really knowing much about it except the fact that people who I like and respect really like that show <laughs> and it is compelling. It is extraordinarily right? oh, I, compelling. I really feel like we have we have reached a new height in our relationship now that you understand my absolute addiction to 90 Day Fiance. All of them. Before the, the 90, is, happily ever after, all of them. Pillow Love talk. in paradise. <laughs> oh, yes. It's like, it, now that I've started watching it, and I've been so deep in it for the last several days, I'm realizing there is so much 90 Day Fiance. I feel like I just tried to start watching Better Call Saul. I'm like, I am behind. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I think that one of the things that happens with reality TV is that that, as with a lot of media that is consumed primarily by women, it gets kind of relegated to unserious. But there's a lot of seriousness and a lot of important things that kind of bubble up as we're, you know, watching these shows, as we're consuming and discussing these shows. Um, Chanda, I'm going to start with you. Like, what reality dating shows are you watching right now and what makes them so compelling? Well, like, what am I not watching? (laughs) That might be like a shorter list. So I guess, you know, the Bachelorettes plural is is on right now, and I I'm just gonna say that I think that this season has been like an unmitigated disaster, and I feel that way like every season about whichever Bachelor Bachelorette. And the only sh- the of the three shows, Bachelor in Paradise is the best one. Oh, I for will sure. fight people about that. Ha- totally fight hands about down, that. hands yeah. down. Yes, yeah. <laughs> but I feel like they took the worst elements of Bachelor in Paradise and mixed them <sighs> with the worst elements of like The Bachelorette and The Bachelor in, into one thing. So that's my current feeling about that. I'm I have been watching all of the different 90 Day Fiance iterations that have been on. So they just finished a season of Love in Paradise which I think is maybe only on Discovery Plus. So I'm just going to say, like, I am a subscriber to Discovery Plus. <laughs> I'm, I'm letting... Um, 
And also, um, I just caught up with the first part of the 90 Day Fiance, the current season reunion. Oh, so that's, that's good. where I am with that. And now 90 Day Fiance UK is on, and that is also interesting. Hmm. I didn't know there was a UK. I'm writing that down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Alyssa's notebook is like half – uh, things about like laws that she's going to read, like actual policy she's going to read, and half recommended <laughs> 90 Day Fiance UK. Yeah, half recommended episodes of streaming dating shows that are available only on Discovery Plus. Wait, which I forgot when Seeking Sister Wife. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so much to unpack with that show. <laughs> yes, I've never heard of that. What is that? Oh. It was the <laughs> companion. Shonda, let me take this one. It was the companion to Sister Wives, right? Which is a very actual, like, okay, first let me to just say. To the Sister I, Wife to. It was to, the Sister Wife to Sister Wives. Right. <laughs> and Sister Wives is about the Brown family and their journey uh, being polygamists out in Utah to Nevada to Arizona. Very, very interesting show because it's a real window into a sort of, culturally normal polygamist family seeking sister wife (laughs) is about and Chana you correct me if I'm wrong it feels a bit like men looking for concubines that's what seeking sister wife feels like to me it's not the same journey the brown family is on Hmm. it I yes I mean I I a little right Part of what's interesting about, you know, with the the Brown family, and I've seen every episode of that show Me at too. least Me once, too. most it's of same, them twice. Same. Um, <laughs> I think what's interesting about that family is that they are true fundamentalist Mormons right. who um, truly believe that this is important for their spiritual journey, that they be in, in a plural marriage. And Seeking Sister Wife kind of goes beyond that to people who are maybe just poly in other ways, but poly specifically in a way that centers the man's needs, right? So it's it's not um there's a lot of like I feel in some ways like sister wives is in easier on me as a feminist than yes. seeking sister wife is because in that case it's part of their religious beliefs. And you also see I I I've also seen every episode of Big Love at least me twice. Too. And I think that that was a show that really grappled with what does it mean to be a feminist in the context of this religious system. And I think that that there are interesting questions there. But seeking sister wife really is like um you know, I just felt like I needed more women in my life or The scammy part of polygamous marriage, which is often, okay, now we need a younger woman who will take care of the children, and that's their solution to their feminist problems, right? Right. So I I feel like there's that element. There is the side of it, though, that I think they just hide the religious parts when people are coming into it for religious beliefs. And I find it weird, actually, that they're hiding that part, given what motivated the show to be interesting, probably to production in the first place. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, Jill, what are your kind of go-to reality TV dating shows and what makes them compelling? I, I honestly need to like broaden my horizons because (laughs) I'm like really in like mostly bachelor nation. Like I watch like other reality stuff, but it's more like below deck and like, (laughs) um, I don't know if this would count. Like this isn't like a dating show, but, um, summer house on Bravo, like I just like really bad shows um (laughs) but I I'm also like pretty new to it like I only started watching um reality tv in general like I don't know three years ago or two two and a half something you know and so but I I really love The Bachelor I love like you said Bachelor in Paradise I think is like far and away the best one because it's like more room for chaos um (laughs) but I um I also watch F Boy Islands (laughs) <laughs> I've been watching that um unfortunately and I there's room for for more so I'm open to suggestions. Okay, well let's zero in on Bachelor Nation because I think that's one of that's like the OG that's one right. of the it, that's the Walmart of dating shows. You know like <laughs> It's not really doing anything the best, but we all know it. We all go there. Or maybe the target of dating shows. We'll say that. <laughs> yeah. Um, we all spend time there sometimes. Sometimes after we leave, we're like, mm, I don't really like what I just did. And sometimes after <laughs> we leave, we're like, that was that was fine. Um, 
this season of The Bachelorette, as Chanda, or Chanda, sorry, looking at a word, uh, as Chanda, as Chanda mentioned, is two bachelorettes involved in, in choosing different, uh, different men. Um, what about this season, uh, is so bad. I, I really want to get more into it because I think that there have been some interesting moments on this season and there have been, um, some moments that, that are really, really cringe. I mean, I feel like I actually am really enjoying every episode. Like I, I I'm loving it. But I can hmm. also see that there is something like truly sinister going on in the way that they are like actively pitting the two bachelorettes against each other. And also like how quick I am to respond to that in the way that they want me to and be like, wow, I love Gabby and also fuck her. Like, <laughs> 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 and so I'm more like having a, a, a self-aware experience of <laughs> what's happening to me while I'm watching this show. Um, but I but I am enjoying it. From like mm. a like Schadenfreude kind of way. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. I just why is Gabby crying so much about her mm. mom in like every episode? She wasn't like so. I get that production makes choices, right? But this totally for people who have seen the the drama and real, which is kind of loosely based on a memoir Love. about reality TV, right? This literally feels like an unreal plot where, like, I found myself asking, like, has someone been messing with her meds? Like, are they adjusting? Because, like, <laughs> she just seems not okay in a very mm -hmm. clear way. And she's on, like, a loop about her mom. So I can't decide if that's just production that's, like, every – but why – even if it is, like, every time she cries, we put it on air. But why is she crying so many distinct times mm -hmm. and telling this, like, same story over and over again? I'm um, – I find that like really disturbing and it does feel like the setup of having two bachelorettes means that they both Gabby and Rachel have experienced like bullying mm -hmm. while they're supposed to be the center of attention, but in, mm. they're kind of like the center of being bullied attention. <laughs> like, <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a little bit like, um, <laughs> I mean, the first image that came to my head was like Midsummer, like the May Queen dance off thing um and it, it it does feel a little bit um i think i wonder about someone who is you know crying a lot i wonder if it sort of is like the producers realize that there's like a place emotionally that they can prod that she's always going to respond that way and it's sort of bordering on cruel that they're just continuing to poke her in a place that is like very, very difficult for her to go. Um, I find it, I, I actually had to stop watching because I found it difficult to watch. It felt really, it felt really mean. Um, I did too. I stopped watching because it felt to Chanda's point about Unreal. It was a, it was an actual storyline in Unreal from, which was five years old, right? That the, the, the production in the, in the scripted show, production was messing with her meds. And I was like, wait, Unreal's kind of based on this and this is happening and like, I don't want to see what's going to happen. So I, I actually, I'm out, I tapped out this season on Bachelorette. Mm -hmm. It feels like they also found that for Rachel though and that like the thing that they are like really milking for her is her like, she's clearly like insecure about like being left especially now like being left for Gabby, you know, and they like keep putting her in these positions to like feel that and it's making her look crazy. And like, I don't think she is crazy probably, but there is, I think like this season, you're right, is like, it's much more like openly sinister than mm -hmm. the past ones, which feel kind of like dumb and innocent, you know? Yeah. And mm -hmm. this one is very like leaning into something dark. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I'm giving them too much credit, but it has always seemed to me that the people behind Bachelor Nation have been evil geniuses and they understand exactly what they're making their audience do. Maybe this isn't necessarily yeah. about what they're doing to the contestants, but what they're forcing the audience to, to do and examine, why am I watching this show? What do I get out of this show? How do wh Why am I able to follow along with what they want me to feel about these two women, knowing that I'm being manipulated. Cause I feel like the show is like self-aware. Yeah. Like it, it, 
There are people, I bet, that work for that show that are just like on the message boards all day. <laughs> and I feel as though the show responds to, to the way that the audience processes the show. So I wonder if it's this like kind of sinister like final form of the show being like, look at what you made us do, <laughs> you know? And it, it I, I don't know. It's it's like, I, I have to say, it, it's I, I know somebody who um, was a contestant on one of the shows, two of the shows. And um, I think that the, the type of person that I know him to be is very different than what he was on the show. Like it, it's, mm -hmm. it's, so we're watching something that is, you know, a creation of the producers, but it's also like pieces of them that maybe that have been kind of deconstructed and reassembled in this way that's like, ugh, kind of hard to watch. So I think for me, that raises the question, part of the way that the, you know, the whole Bachelor franchise works is that I'm, each season is a sequel, Right. We don't right. we don't talk about it in those terms, but each season is a sequel because, you know, the person who's the bachelor or the bachelorette from a previous season and it jumps. And so it may be that you have to be two seasons back to know who that person is and that and that sort of thing. And that's kind of how they pull you in and keep you there. But that also means that the people who are now signing up to be the bachelorette, the bachelor, bachelorettes, plural, know that production does this. They've seen what the show did with people. They know the difference between who those people were and how they were portrayed on TV. Mm. So I find myself spending a lot of time being like, why did they sign up for this? Like, why did Gabby and Rachel sign up for this? Because they must have known that every way that they could make this mean and unpleasant for them, they were probably going to try. And so on the one hand, I'm like pained for Gabby, right? And then on the other hand, I'm like, but Gabby must have known, like she's trading this for something. Mm -hmm. And I I don't know, I would never be a person who would trade something like that. So I don't know how to evaluate. How does she decide that it's worth it to mm -hmm. go through this minefield that's totally unpredictable? So are we watching a game between the contestants and the producers and we can only see one side of the game? Um, like they set the rules and everyone who enters the game thinks they can win, but none of them can win. It's so I think dark. That's, if you watch Unreal, that seems about right. <laughs> also, I can't stop thinking about what you said about how, like, the game has become self-aware. Like, what's that, like, bad Anne Hathaway movie where she, there's, like, a video game? <laughs> uh, I was going to say, you're going to have to be more specific. <laughs> <if we're> <laughs> um, or, like, even, like, there's something, like, Westworld-y about it where it's, like, the people on the show are gaining awareness, but it's still not enough. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right, right. It'll you always the house always wins. You know, right. you're, you're never going to beat the you're never going to beat the game. Um, I want to talk a little bit about something that we talked about last time that you were on Chanda, which is um, the kind of missing queerness and missing poly storylines from reality dating shows. I wonder if things have become more queer and how they have, and whether or not that is sort of like living up to your hopes for a more queer reality dating show environment. So I think, you know, just, just to start with Bachelor Nation, I think what's interesting about the Bachelorettes is that early in the season, there are these moments where you look at the two of them with each other. And my spouse multiple times was like, they should clearly just choose each other and leave. Yes. <laughs> and they have... They have better chemistry with each other than they have with any of the men this yes. season. I think that that's actually part of what's weird about this season is they have zero chemistry with any of the men. There was one person who has since been eliminated. I won't say who it was that someone was trying to have good chemistry with, but I don't think it's actually working. But the two of them... I, as as a queer woman, I'm like, you guys are so obviously like, if you weren't socialized in a culture that taught you to see yourself as straight, and frankly, I think monosexuals are rare and people are just confused. I think <laughs> I think the religious right is correct to be afraid that it's going to turn out everybody's queer because I think that's the, that's the situation. <laughs> that's my hypothesis. I'm a scientist. I'll, I will just wait for the data to, to bear out its results. But I, I really think that there... And I do think production is very smart. They've gotten as far as they have because they're very smart. I think that they knew that they were playing with that dynamic that arises between so-called straight women. 
in a culture um, that pres that presumes heterosexuality. So I think there there's that element. It is interesting that the season of Love in Paradise actually featured two different gay couples. Um, although in one case there was um, a man is involved, there's a third party, and um. You know, I think that that one storyline is probably one where maybe they actually hired the people to be like, this is going to be your storyline. That mm -hmm. one just felt like very like it was too telenovela. It was too <laughs> like I'm um, driven. Um, but there was actually a, another gay couple in, in Love in Paradise where I think that they dealt with like the real issues that gay couples deal with. And I'm um, I. I I found it really interesting and it followed a very different pattern. The 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 kind of subtext of 90 Day Fiance, right, is that it pushes your xenophobic button and is like, mm -hmm. do you trust this person? Are they doing it for the wrong reasons? And the difference between straight couples and gay couples is that you know that nobody pretends to be gay for for social gain mm -hmm. because it still sucks so bad to be queer in so many quarters. Um, and that means that you can actually look at it as a genuine potential love story because that piece is just totally missing. And um, there was something really interesting about that for me. Hmm. Um, Jill, you were nodding uh, a lot when we were talking about this season of The Bachelorette and the chemistry between the two bachelorettes. Uh, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. I was I was like nodding so hard that I was like thrashing my head. <laughs> um, no, well, I mean, my girlfriend and I are watching it every week and like our friend who is also gay comes over and we watch it and like literally every shot that's supposed to just be like B-roll of them like holding hands and whatever, we're like screaming at the TV being like that, like exactly what you said, like they have chemistry. And I think it makes me feel like I have this like specific moment that I always come back to when I was coming out and I like had this like really, really intense, close relationship with my best friend. And I called my other friend and I was crying to her. And I was like, I think like that I might have like stronger feelings than like just, you know, like I think I have romantic feelings. And she kind of like thought she was like talking me off the ledge. And we've talked about this now. And I was like, that was <laughs> maybe not okay. But I think she thought she was doing me a favor to be like, no, no, no. Like, relationships between girls are just like always so intense and I think you're just confused and I was and that set me back <laughs> for like a month and then I was like no no, no I am gay um but I see that <laughs> I, but I see that like so much especially within like bachelor nation where it's like they, you know so much of the show is about like we're two best friends, like just two girls who like would rather be together forever, but we can't ugh, because we're straight. And it's like, <laughs> it's exactly what you're saying, Shonda. It's just like, no, you guys, it's okay. Like you guys clearly have chemistry. You want to spend all your time together. Like there's just like a mental barrier there. But I think it is so crazy that this whole season is being sold as like two best friends. We do everything together, um, but we won't kiss. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Alyssa, I wonder. Or what at you least, oh, go ahead. At least have a threesome, right? <laughs> like that, that, just if try you really it. do everything together, should it not be like sex? Like I, I don't like. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I don't know. That would not be for network TV. I feel. I feel like that would be <laughs> streaming, st streaming only. But people would subscribe to Discovery Plus specifically to be like, okay, these two best friends yeah. who legitimately care about each other, and they're not just doing it for the cameras. <laughs> are going to have a threesome with a guy. <laughs> um, Alyssa, I wonder what, um, as, as like a, a lifelong straight woman. Um, Thank you, you so much. <laughs> are you okay? Are I'm you okay? All right. I just, I'm all right. <laughs> outed. I mean, I'm knows? of a different generation. <laughs> <laughs> um, when, when you watch shows like, when you watch the season of The Bachelorette, does does anything pop for you like along those lines? Do you see them together and think like, why don't you guys just run away and Thelma and Louise? I have not watched The Bachelorette enough to have felt that way because I was kind of repelled. Like the last couple of seasons have really <laughs> turned me off. But I will say to Chanda's point, the my favorite couple on like true favorite couple that I really rooted for were Armando and Kenny on 90 Day Fiance because 
their storyline normally, for those listening who are not 90 Day Fiance aficionados, um, normally there's like one couple you're kind of rooting for and then you spend your time deciding which member of which couple is the worst, right? Like who <laughs> is the worst? Is this – and usually, to be honest, and to talk – the xenophobia, it's usually the American who's the worst. It's like, it is almost always the American who's like, what are you, you going to do? Like, they're just, anyway, the American's the worst. But Armando and Kenny, it's like they had real struggles. Like, they had struggles unlike any other, uh, any other couple did. Like, he lived in Mexico. Kenny, the American, moved to Mexico. Nobody ever does that on this show. And knowing that Armando's family was not remotely going to be okay with this. And so I found them the most compelling. I rooted for them. I cried when they got married. And so I think that it's like that they should have far more storylines like Armando and Kenny because they're actually the most compelling in a way that makes you come back and want to watch, not just like – Oh my God, it's Karen Guillermo and it's going to be a train wreck. Like, it's, they're the non train wrecks, right? They're the people who you actually root for. I mean, I, as a, as a brand new, I'm going to say fan of 90 Day Fiance, I, um, yes, warms my heart. I, I have to say, um, the Emily and Kobe storyline makes me, she's a wreck, (laughs) makes me want to smash my, face into a brick wall it's so there are spoilers that i want to say that i'm going to keep contained well can i just can i just survey those of us who have watched 90 day fiance when kobe told her to shut the fuck up i thought he was right (laughs) she was being everyone's like misogynistic man from africa and it's like oh dude she fucking deserved that and a lot more when she i i think it's actually misogynistic it's misogynistic to think that no woman ever should be told to shut the fuck up. <laughs> she should human. Emily should have. Every human should be told to shut the fuck up from time when to time. When they should shut the fuck up. And she should have. Yeah. Um, the amount of, I mean, like speaking of, you know, the, the misogynist, like the structural context of him as a man from Africa, there's a whole like Mandingo vibe happening in how <sighs> she talks about their sex life. And yes. <sighs> I'm... There's just a lot of like, he's my big African. There, it's like, it's so not okay. And I worry so much about the the kid situation and what that's going to be like to for for the kid to grow up in in that environment with that family. Um, and this is something as someone who comes from a, a a family with a black parent and a white parent, I think that this is a dynamic that is extremely under discussed, mm-hmm. which is white mothers who have racist ideas about the kids black fathers and how that shapes the kids entire ability to self conceive um, and feel safe in their home environment and actually ultimately it often messes with people's ability to build community connections with other black folks because they feel like they're choosing between their mother's perspective and their identity in some way. So mm-hmm. I I actually found that really stressful from that point of mm-hmm. view. I was like, oh, this is someone that like in 20 years, I'm going to be sitting them down and talking, be talking to them about like how to relate to their blackness. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> it's very stressful. Yeah, it, it does seem like there is a... Um, there's a component of some of the relationships where it feels as though the American views their partner from a different country as a sort of like exotic pet. Yes. Almost. Uh, absolutely. Angela. Like, yeah. Like Angela. Uh, uh, Bilal. Bilal. Oh my God. <laughs> he is, Bilal has ish. Um, Angela for sure. But like actually almost all of them are, there's always this like, and this is always my favorite part because it happens in almost every couple where they're where the person who is not from America is like, by the way, my country's better. America sucks. I'm only here for you. I gave up a lot in my awesome other country. And I'm always like, you speak your truth. That is that is correct. <laughs> someone someone brought you to some very bad part of Florida and you you're correct. Your country's better. <laughs> I do want to make a, a silver lining point about the season of 90 Day, which is this is like a very mild spoiler for the reunion, but you're going to get Kenny at the reunion. So if you haven't watched the reunion, Kenny and Billy are doing commentary. This is a new thing they're trying with the 90 Day Fiance reunion. So Ooh. I'm kind um, of into it, though. I, Kenny. It should be a little bit more spontaneous. It feels scripted, yes. but I'm I'm excited for the second episode. <laughs> 
Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I can't wait to get all the way through it and then work my way back through all the seasons and slowly lose my mind <laughs> as I contemplate all of the like tiramisu thousand layer pancake of issues that this show brings up. It's like. It's so much. Um, Jill, back to you. Um, let's talk <laughs> about some of the other um, reality shows that you watch and whether you see queer representation on the show um, and whether the shows, it's separately, whether the shows appeal to um, queer people and why. I, I mean, I, I even think the like really painfully heterosexual shows appeal to queer people and I'm like not quite even positive like where I'm coming from some of the time but mm -hmm. you know like even shows like you know Bachelor in Paradise I there was a like mildly queer storyline I think two years three years ago I, what is time but with mm -hmm. Demi <laughs> Demi um, yeah, yeah. yeah I read your article about that at the time yeah no and like I felt like when that happened even though again like it was pretty tame because it was it wasn't somebody she met on the show it was like I'm still thinking about my like ex-girlfriend and they like bring her to the island or whatever but I was watching it and I was just like it it would be so easy to incorporate queer people here like like, like it, they made it so easy they could do it so easily um and I and I feel the same about like um I guess like the structure of f-boy island is literally like about men even though it seems like the next season is gonna be about like they're gonna like flip the switch but I I just think like it is really easy to include multiple bisexual people or pansexual people on a, you know, mostly heterosexual show um, and like shake things up. Something that I think is so funny that happened to me last summer was I met some, um, I, I don't know her name and it's probably better that way because I probably <laughs> shouldn't say this at all, but she, I met some <laughs> like producer that works in the Bachelor Nation shows and I was like just making some like, offhanded joke about how there needs to be a lesbian bachelor because there would just be so much drama because you know the stereotype lesbians move quickly um <laughs> and like people within the house would mingle there would be so much drama there like that like you know whoever the like main bachelorette is like it would just be a complete shit show in like a really compelling reality tv way and she literally stared at me and was like huh that's a good idea. Seriously? And I was like, you've never thought about it? That's like, like so obvious. I know. I was like, this is like a really old lesbian joke about like <laughs> you hauling and like, I don't know. I just, you never thought about it. You were like, as if I was the first person to pitch her this. And she was like, huh, yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, part of me is like, I don't even know if they're thinking about this, um, but they need to do it. And it would mm -hmm. be, I think like, <laughs> the most dramatic season yet but uh <laughs> <laughs> I just you made me think about that one season of are you the one I don't know if anybody else has seen the one mm -mm. queer season of are you the one where they put a bunch of bisexual and pansexual people in the house together and kind of let it go and I at first was like super excited about it and then I actually found it to be one of the worst seasons of are you the one <laughs> in the end um, and I actually think part of it is – so there's the very obvious, like, for a show where you have, like, a bachelor or a bachelorette, like, you have to have someone who's interested in people with a, a, a variety of gender identities, right? But I actually think what they messed up with that one season of Are You the One was that everybody was bisexual and pansexual. I didn't really see the argument for that. I think it would have been fine if some people had been gay identified, lesbian identified, um, you know, even though I question the true existence of monosexuals, monosexual <laughs> identified in some way. Um, and I think that that, you know, insofar as we're OK with like the emotional stressors and all of the ethical questions that come with putting people in emotionally stressful situations, but assuming people want to sign up for that. Exactly. It creates interesting drama. And I do think that there is an element of, you know, people always talk about like, oh, liberal Hollywood. But that's clearly like not how it's actually working. If it was, we would get way more black filmmaking than we do. Mm -hmm. Right. Like people just like it still doesn't cross their minds. And I, I think the other thing is, is that they still just don't see us as an audience. They still think that the audience is a white, straight, like a white, het, cis, I'm um, housewife in mm -hmm. 
Iowa or Idaho, as if there are not gay people in Idaho, as if there are not people of color in Idaho, right? Like, mm-hmm. um, I think that they're still thinking of their nar- their audience in very narrow ways and thinking about, like, who they can sell commercials to, obviously. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> uh, Chandra, I remember, I think the, the first time we talked about reality TV when you were on, you said something about how, like, Polly, uh, like, it... it a lot of the dating shows make it seem like monogamy is the problem. Like it, all their problems would be solved if people were just like, oh, yeah, we're poly. Um, and I would love to hear your thoughts on like this new generation, these new seasons of dating shows and how they confront monogamy or entertain polyamory um, and what you make of progress that's being made in that in that space. Yeah, I mean, as a, the last time I think I actually declared that The Bachelor was the great American polyamorous franchise, right? Because like they're basically <laughs> just poly for like whatever the the ten weeks that episodes are on the air, and then suddenly they're monogamous again. So it's like a temporary poly show, uh-huh. um, and it's kind of playing with the fact that people are actually interested in that idea. But at the end of the day, we return to our Puritan values. Like it's like you take a break from being a Puritan and then um, we return to being a Puritan. What was interesting about the season of Love in Paradise is that there is some poly discussion happening in relation to the queerness. And one of the storylines I think is super disingenuous. And actually one of the storylines I think is like very real of I love you, I want to be with you. I am also a poly person. That's something we have to navigate and figure out. And I think that there is this, you know, there's a segment of of the LGBTQ community that is like, I just want to fit into society as it is. And so don't associate polyamory with me. Don't associate um, the, the, quote, bad lifestyles, because then that marks us as a bad lifestyle. Um, and I think what was kind of interesting is that at least in one of those Love in Paradise storylines, it pushes the idea that for some people, this is part of their queerness and it can be healthy and wholesome and not at all be about like, I don't love you or I'm not committed to you. Um, and in that sense, it kind of is like the the Brown family sister wife um, storyline, which is that you can create whole real families around this that, you know, also maybe experience divorce or or other like people don't always stay together. But it's not about like, I need you to only focus on me. It's about what is our relationship. And I think that that is like an, an interesting challenge. I was pretty freaked out about the Abby Gabby storyline, though, because I was like, oh, this is such a stereotype of like two lesbians who rope the unsuspecting straight man in and <laughs> they have like vultured his life or something like that. It felt <laughs> I Wait, do les- the- is that a stereotype? Do lesbians do that? They, they surround <laughs> I- straight men and suck their life force because that's awesome. had no idea that I just have to trash my ex's families I have been through at least three relationships where the in-law side parents were convinced that I was some kind of lesbian succubus who (laughs) was trying to drain their child of their finances and I was going to go and take the money to be with some other woman and actually I'm I'm blanking on the movie with Gina Gershon and Jennifer Tilly. Bound. But I think, bound. Like, bound. I think everybody thinks that, like, <laughs> lesbians are bound. That, like, that's all we do. Like, right? That's and I've had movie. this with, with women partners and man partners. Their parents think the same thing. Yeah. Hmm. Very um, Jennifer's body. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, also. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wanted to, you know, as, as we were just discussing this, one thing that we've kind of left out of this discussion is uh, the Netflix dating shows and um, kind of what a hot mess they are. Um, the Ultimatum. Did did you all watch The Ultimatum? Oh, yeah. I almost yes. forgot about The Ultimatum. I binged that. I did too. <laughs> <laughs> um, Alyssa, what did you make of that? That was kind of a hot mess, wasn't it? That was very hard to watch. I mean, I watched the whole thing. Don't get me yes. wrong. But again, <laughs> it's like the people who should not have ended up together ended up together. And it was – it really – that one was one of the ones where it just felt so manipulated that I was like, it just felt overproduced, you know, that this was like, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't watch it. If there's another season, will I watch it? Of course. But I didn't, I didn't love it. It felt emotionally manipulative. I mean, they all are, but that one more so. Yeah. It also felt as though, you know, it kind of did the thing where it was like, 
forcing people to be poly all right. of a sudden and then forcing them back. It was this really weird like thing that happened. I I, I really Well, it was it like bend. forcing you to go through poly to find to reclaim your mononess. Like it it felt it felt it felt like a game, I guess. I mean, they're all a game, but that one felt much more like I don't know, shoots and ladders. Also, there, there was, was a, I think oh, there was ahead. a spin, there was another iteration of this that was on Amazon Prime that I recently watched that was, I think it was called The One That Got Away. Yeah. Where they really like, you start building a connection with someone and they were like, actually, someone new is here. And so the production was literally, it was like unmasking of Unreal because you just watch production disrupt them repeatedly. Oh, wow. I did not see that one. Also, that sounds I don't know. If- I don't know if you guys know this, but the ultimatum does have another thing out and it's all women. It's like a lesbian season. <gasps> oh, okay. See, I'll watch that for sure. Yeah. And it's I don't know if to am I excited or horrified? Which one? Well, maybe it's I, mean, <laughs> I think it's gonna That's be the it's gonna be like the most line. toxic thing that has ever aired and absolutely a setback for the community, and I will watch it. <laughs> <laughs> That's but I I don't is was Love is Blind on Netflix? Mm-hmm. And I like that blind. one. I like 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 I like Love is Blind. I felt that one was very like honest, I guess. Every kind of. season though has somebody that just just exudes January 6th energy. <laughs> oh, like 100%. At least one. Like this past season what was Was the name? blonde Shauna? guy? Yeah, there was there was the guy who didn't know what Shane. to do with his face. Shane. Shane. Right. Shane. Shane. Bad vibes. Very oh, short of the capital. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but Shane of the, the blonde one that had like sort of um uh like a nineteen sixties Barbie colored skin, that like orange like hold a <laughs> hold a foil thing under your face kind of a tan. Um her family was like, oh, they were they were so January 6th. <laughs> they they were. Right out of the purge. That was like a oh. purge family. I felt like that whole scene was the purge. Like, oh, yes. Like their live, laugh, love stencils are human blood. 100%. What? <laughs> <laughs> I love describing people as very January 6th. It's, like, it's such a visceral image. <laughs> it is. It's you so know exactly what I. You know exactly what I mean. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so Jill, you said that you think that an all-lesbian ultimatum is going to be bad for the community. Um, what would an ideal queer dating reality show look like? Like, what would a, a health – is there a, is it possible for there to be, like, a healthy one? Like, what would that look like? I mean, I feel like – I don't know about healthy, but I think, like, the most basic version of it is just, like, a bachelor-type setup, you know? Um, I think, like – that's like the the clean teen version of a lesbian dating show i personally like would be the most invested and excited for like lesbian bachelor in paradise Uh, and doesn't even honestly like i don't think it has to be like specifically lesbian like i just think like if everyone on that beach had like differing sexualities that would be more interesting um but you know i mean like I think the ultimatum is an absolutely insane setup for a show. So like, I am excited to watch that happen <laughs> for, for women. Um, but I, uh, what was the other one that we were talking about? Um, Love is Blind. Love is Blind. 90 Day Fiance. I, I don't, I was going to say something else. I forgot, but I, this, oh, I was going to say unrelated that show Tampa Bay's that was like a one season lesbian reality show on Amazon prime. It's like I watched every episode and it was like horrible and like not even good or compelling and and bad for the community. And I hope there's another season. So it's like (laughs) the bar is just so, so low that like even if this is like the worst, you know, the worst examples of televised queer women in modern history, uh, I'll be there. (laughs) I I would like to see. A married at first sight, like a lesbian married at first sight. Mm. We've have you seen watched? Les- Go, no, finish what you're going to say, Chanda. Sorry. Yeah, we've seen lesbians on the Australian married at first That's sight. That's what I was going to say. And the Australian married at first sight has an interesting twist where the couples have regular contact with each other in kind of a structured way that leads to interesting drama happening. It but is I think far it be- superior to the American version. It is. It is. It is in many ways. And I think that 
I, but I would be interested to see like an American style version of Married at First Sight with lesbians. My only hesitation there, because I think, you know, I, I do think some of those marriages do last. We know that people have children and, um, and, and sometimes remain friends, etc. The thing that makes me nervous about it is they screw black women on the American mm. show like so badly. Like they just put black women in these terrible, terrible unethical positions where it's like you knew and they only not exclusively do it to black women but black women are disproportionately the group they do it to so it would be interesting i guess to to see how that you know even to do one where there are no white people and i think Mm -hmm. they came close to that was it houston they came close to that but i think Mm -hmm. that that would be interesting too Hmm. Well, we've given out so many free ideas for great reality (laughs) dating competition shows today. 